from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, K-State's Anita Dilly provides a research update on cover crops as a tool for weed control in crop rotations. She'll highlight how well spring-planted cereal crops perform in this respect in no-till cropping systems. Then K-State's Doug Jardine talks about plant health issues turning up in newly planted corn as a result of the overly wet weather. And he points out that those same conditions are setting up soybean stands for sudden death syndrome problems later on this growing season. And on this week's horticulture segment later on, K-State's Ward Upham talks about the heavy seed set on certain landscape trees this spring and why that's of importance to you homeowners. All this and more next on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Once more, we want to talk more about cover crop productivity and the role that those can play in our crop rotations for that is the focus of several research angles out of the K-State Department of Agronomy. And here's another one, the utility of cover crops for weed suppression on our crop ground. And joining us is K-State agronomist Anita Dilly and this is her specialty, if you will, cover crops and where they fit into our cropping systems in Kansas. It's one of several areas of research that K-State has undertaken along this line, right, Anita? Yes, it is. So my interest, of course, is in weed science. As a weed ecologist, I'm interested in alternative ways to manage our weed populations. But cover crops have so many different benefits, and depending what a grower wants out of their cover crop, they may look at different plants or different timings or different ways to implement and use those cover crops. When I'm specifically thinking about weeds, then first of all is to know what is the key weed species that they're worried about and when it occurs in their cropping system and how they've been currently dealing with it. And then thinking how a cover crop might also fit into their crop rotation and then putting the two together because out of our research, we're really finding that we need a cover crop in place before that key weed starts to emerge and grow so that all the resources that plants need are going to the cover crop and not for the weeds. What attributes do you look for in a cover crop for weed suppression in a general sense then? In a general sense, we're really going after quick establishment, quick growth, and a lot of biomass. When we think of weeds, they're trying to get the sunlight and the nutrients and water away from our cash crops. And especially in a fallow system or over winter when we don't have a cash crop growing, then the weeds are taking those resources. And if we can get the benefit of weed suppression and the other benefits we think of with cover crops, that's better than giving it to the weeds. For example, We've been doing work with horseweed or mare's tail in a lot of our no-tillage cropping systems. And because we don't till and all we use are herbicides, then we've ended up with uh, resistant populations to some of these herbicides. And so how can we incorporate a cover crop into that system to then diversify the kind of weed management choices I have to suppress those horseweed and to allow the chemical program that I might be using to be more effective? And so in that scenario, we're really looking at fall seeded cover crops like cereals that can grow well over in our environment uh, throughout the state of Kansas and be able to be in place and compete against those mare's tail that we know are coming up in the fall as well. So right on that example, what have you identified as cover crops that will accomplish that suppression goal? The key thing we look for are the cereals. And so we've looked at winter triticalia and winter rye and even used winter wheat um, that we were not planning to take to seed yield um, to be competitive against our horse weed. 
People may mix a few other things in there, something like um, in the mustard category, a, a radish, a turnip, or something like that. Those often don't make it through the winter, so we really want to make sure we've got something that can survive over the winter and be competing with that horseweed throughout that season. So those cereal grains get the job done by and large. Right. Is there any downside to those within the system, though? The downside to those um, is when we're trying to get to the end of the season and terminate prior to planting our cash crop. So we finally decide what the effective cover crop is, get it established, get it growing, competing against our weeds. But we know we have a cash crop plan in mind of what we want to plant, and we need to be able to terminate it, kill it, and be creating a good seed bed for our cash crop. And in some of the studies that we've been doing, we've ended up with uh, weather like we have right now, where it's really wet. And your cover crop is growing like crazy, but you can't quite get to it yet to terminate it. And so that's a challenge. And so um, we are starting to do some additional research where we're really investigating and fine-tuning our system and understanding when to terminate and what impacts timing a termination has on planting our cash crops, whether it's corn or soybean for the most part. So we're really interested and we've got some funding support from the Kansas Corn Commission where we're looking at time of termination. Um, This is also important um, from the NRCS and from insurance perspectives that we don't want to lose yield in our cash crop because we did something with our cover crop or incorrectly with our cover crop. And so we're really interested in do I need to terminate that cover crop two weeks ahead of planting? Is a week okay? Can I plant it green? You may hear that from a number of folks where they will spray it or terminate it after they've actually planted their crop. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at how do we optimize that? What's the right thing to do? So we've got graduate students and um, research projects in place on farmers fields throughout the state as well as on our research station here near Manhattan and at Ottawa trying to look at those different timings and then what kind of impact do they have on corn establishment and growth and does it matter? But it, the suspicion here is that it does matter. It, sounds. It, it can matter. And so we're trying to uh, just determine, you know, how do we optimize that? How do we fine tune the system to make sure we're giving the best recommendations to our growers about implementing a cover crop but then terminating it at the right time? Lots of intricacies to the system. That's pretty obvious here, Anita. But back to the the main objective, and that is weed suppression. You're looking at uh, some options ahead of soybeans now, you say. Correct. So horseweed is a problem in no-till because we don't have tillage to control it. And so we've been using cover crops for that. Horseweed, for the most part, is a fall emerging winter annual style of plant. But we also have, of course, going into soybeans, a lot of issues with our pigweed species. So thinking of palmer amaranth and water hemp, those are plants that tend to emerge here in May and into June and July. They continue to emerge. So we're interested in what kind of cover crops can we have in place that produce enough biomass to sort of put a layer of residue on the soil surface to reduce the number of those pigweeds that are going to be coming up in the soybean crop. And so if the goal is to go after those summer annuals, and if we had the right weather, we can get cover crops seeded in March here in Kansas. We have that flexibility to be able to get in early and get some good growth there. And some of the work we've done in the past has looked at using a spring oat or a spring pea if we get good establishment there, or even a mixture of those two. They really like the cool spring weather, can put on a lot of biomass prior to the time that we want to plant soybeans towards the end of May, beginning of June, and be able to help with suppression of the pigweed species that we're worried about. Now, the key there is establishing that cover crop early, early, which maybe this year was a bit of a challenge or not. If you could get in in March and you were able to do it, that worked well. But we were having you know a little bit of a later spring and then all of a sudden all this moisture. So that's where often the fall seeded cover crop gives you a little more of a, a window and a guarantee that you'll have a cover crop in place. Um, if you were banking on the spring one, you may or may not have been able to do that. Hmm. And again, that goal is to get the biomass and some kind of persistent biomass that we can put on the soil surface to reduce the number of weeds that are coming up and how well they grow. So you're still fleshing that one out to see how well those particular spring-planted crops accomplish the goal of weed suppression and control. Correct. We've um, had some studies done also in collaboration with Augustino Bohr in the western part of the state. Um, He's had cover crop plots for a few years at the HB Ranch just outside of Hayes and then at Colby 
where they were looking to establish these spring seeded cover crops and use the ones that I suggested. They were mixing rye, triticale, oats, maybe a spring pea planted in that March time frame, but they were going to wheat at the end of the year. And so they could let them grow into middle to end of June. And they were able to get quite a bit of growth and good suppression on weeds in that one. So we were able to see on average, and I'm seeing this consistently across a lot of our cover crop studies, that I can cut the number of weeds that are there by about 50%. So I've got half the weeds that I need to deal with. And then the size, the biomass, just the weight of those weeds is reduced by about 95%. And so that's a lot easier to control with another tool like a herbicide or something else when that cover crop has already made that kind of impact on the weeds that I'm going to be dealing with. Well, in closing, Anita, what's your next interest in the area of using cover crops for the purpose of weed control? One of the other interesting areas that we're starting to explore is the allelopathic component of cover crops, the idea that it's not just this biomass shading and taking resources from the weeds, but that they may also, as they're the plants decaying or exuding chemicals into the soil, that can potentially inhibit weed seeds from germinating and, and growing and establishing. There's quite a bit known that rye can do this. What we're starting to explore some of the wheat varieties that we have currently available or that we could potentially breed to be able to provide a little more allelopathic component. So can we add another piece to the cover crop to make it more suppressive against weeds? That should be interesting. And that could open up more new doors here. If you it can. is. We're yeah. really excited. Um, we've got a, an undergraduate student sort of growing a lot of different wheat varieties <laughs> and, and seeing how what kind of impact it has on weeds. So we're really at the beginning stage, but there's quite a bit of interest in what we can do and Kansas being a wheat state, then is there something we can do with that wheat in this way? Well, this has been a fruitful research program out of the Department of Agronomy for quite a few years now, and it continues to explore new possibilities. And as far as cover crops and what they bring to the table in weed control for producers, given our challenges in this area, very important work indeed. Anita, thank you for briefing us on where you stand on this today. We'll have you back soon. Appreciate the time to share it again. She's a weed ecologist out of K-State's Department of Agronomy. That's Anita Dilley. You're tuned into Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and welcome back. As we'll turn to the row crop scene in Kansas now, and as you well know, planting progress has been sporadic at best, some corn in the ground, just very early in the progress for our soybean plantings in Kansas. But yet, we can talk about potential and existing disease problems, and for that we bring by Doug Jardine, row crop disease specialist, K-State Research and Extension. And as one might well expect, Doug, the persistent wet and cold weather surely would prompt some issues in what crops are in the ground right now, would they not? Well, absolutely, Eric. And whatever the weather is, it seems we have a cadre of diseases that are going to be a problem. So we have our dry weather diseases and we have our wet weather diseases. And so obviously uh, with the significant rainfall, I mean, not just here in Kansas, but across the, the corn and soybean belt, you know, there are some things that we need to be thinking about. Uh, I will just say we've, because so few uh, soybeans have been planted and really we're not even quite halfway on corn, we haven't had anything actually come into the diagnostic lab uh, at this point in time. Uh, but from our previous experiences, we can make some predictions of what we're likely to see in the next month or two. Let's start with corn then. Uh, there have been some observations out there on cold weather crown stress on corn. Yes, uh, that's a phenomena that we, uh, oh, maybe 20 years ago, we kind of figured out. And, and what happens in that situation is when the ground is saturated around the crown, it cuts off the oxygen to those cells, and they become, the, the term we use is leaky. And uh, it's uh, in the uh, 
plant physiology world, it's called chilling injury. And uh, those leaky cells will then cause a discoloring of the, the crown area on the corn plant, and it will damage the water nutrient conducting cells to the point that they become less efficient at moving water and nutrients out of the soil. And it's not a problem that kills the plant, but it generally manifests itself by seeing individual plants or, or, or patches of plants in the field that are going to grow very slowly. So as we get warmer weather and the corn gets to the nitrogen and starts to take off, these plants are going to lag behind. And sometimes they show nutrient deficiency symptoms, particularly potash deficiency, but there can be some general yellowing, similar to nitrogen deficiency, uh, maybe even occasionally some purpling, which is a little confusing because we, have a, we know that there are certain hybrids that just turn purple in general when it's cold. Uh, it's a hybrid characteristic, and then they grow out of it. But uh, this would be more of a, a phosphorus deficiency type of thing. And when we get those plants in the diagnostic lab and we cut them open, you will see anywhere from a gray to a dark brown discoloration in that crown. For a long time, people thought it was uh, a fusarium stalk rot, but we were never able to consistently identify any pathogens out of them. And it was after a couple of years, we figured out that it was weather-related that we, we started to determine a pattern. And these plants will, will survive and grow, but the, the problem is as we get into uh, the main part of the summer, and it's if we get very hot and we do start getting a little short on moisture, uh, those plants are going to be the first to die prematurely with then symptoms of later season stalk rot. Mm. And, you know, it, it can be just a, a matter of a few plants in the field. Uh, it can be a couple of percentages or it can be fairly widespread. We I remember years ago over in east central Kansas, we had a field that was yeah, significantly affected by it and ended up not doing too well that year. Of course, there's nothing that a grower can do about this condition, well, culturally no, speaking. No, but not now. But we do know kind of, again, from experience that hybrids with southern genetics tend to be more susceptible than hybrids with northern genetics. And, and farmers can maybe talk to their, their seed representative and find out if their hybrids come from the north or the south, kind of in, in general. And that might be a clue as to how much of this they might see. So, and, you know, here in Cairns, we're kind of in a transition zone. So you could have either in any given hybrid. But this is mostly for future reference with regard to cold weather crown stress. Are there any other disease conditions that have already expressed themselves out there? Or are we just waiting for the other shoe to fall, so to say? Well, one of the things, you know, we might be looking for are are seedling blight issues, particularly pythium seedling blight, um, where we've had plants that have already emerged and they're in waterlogged fields, uh, you know, that's a potential. Um, it could even keep some of these seeds from germinating, and so you're gonna, it's going to be manifested as skips in the field. Um, and if you go and look for a seed, it won't be there because it's kind of disintegrated from the disease infestation. And, you know, all corn comes pretreated uh, with a kind of a cocktail of uh, both fungicides and insecticides, and typically they will hold. When we get extended periods of weather like this, I'd probably be more concerned about corn that hasn't emerged than than corn that's already up. Uh, But, yeah, we're we're likely to see some. And, you know, if it's bad enough, then replanting is the only option. Sometimes it's just spot replanting. But, you know, there really is no action that can be taken other than potentially replanting where the stand loss is great enough. But the fungicide treatments will hang in there for a while, you think? Yeah, you know, typically they're good for 7 to 10, maybe even out to 14 days. There's, you know, some discussion that maybe if the soils are a little colder, uh, they may last a little bit longer because uh, the slower microbial breakdown of the fungicide that's on the seed. Um, I don't know if we have any research evidence that, that would point to that, but it just kind of makes common sense to me. And we've definitely had some cold soil temperatures, so uh, they may still be hanging in there. Uh, a little bit, uh, but it's just kind of wait and see. Right. Let's turn to soybeans, if we might, Doug. And once more, with very few acres in the ground compared to where we normally are at this point of the spring, but for those stands that have been planted, then overly wet conditions, you say root rots could be flourishing out there. Well, yes. And I think the by far the main one we would be concerned about at this point of the season is pythium seedling blight or pythium root rot or pythium seed rot. It goes by different names. It likes wet, cool weather. And so that is the pattern we've been in. Unlike 
maybe 10 years ago when only about 10% of our soybeans were treated with a fungicide seed treatment. Now, in, in some places, I've heard estimates as high as 90%. And, and so that's a good thing. But if you're one of those growers that's still in the 10%, uh, you know, it's not too late to get a seed treatment on. And we particularly want products that uh, have a pythium-specific product in them. Um, and there's, there's a whole list of names, but the three common names of fungicides that we would look for is our old standby metalaxyl, which uh, was originally marketed as apron seed treatment, uh, mefinoxum, um, which is uh, apron XL, and then uh, a new product called ethoboxum, and, and uh, it has a, a couple of different uh, trade names that you might find it by. And they all do very well against uh, the pythium disease, so uh, they would want to make sure. Um, in some cases, rate becomes important. I know we've had some some cases in the past where people have used Cruiser Max, and Cruiser Max has mefinoxum in um, and it, you know, it didn't quite get the job done, but there's another product called Cruiser Max Plus that has a higher rate of the mefinoxum in it. And, and so in some cases, you know, if you happen to have the, that product with the higher rate or request a, a higher rate of one of these products, if you're getting your seed treated privately, you know, that might not be a bad idea this year. So pay extra attention to your seed treatment protocol this year. And you say that these conditions may well have predisposed soybeans to sudden death syndrome later on the season. Well, you know, over the last 15 or 20 years, we've had a steadily increasing number of fields in the state that have sudden death syndrome in them. If you look, uh, it tends to be in our river valleys, so you'll find them along the Missouri River in northeast Kansas, all throughout the Kansas River Valley from Manhattan all the way down to Kansas City. We can find them uh, in the Republican River Valley, especially starting about Clay Center and heading up towards Concordia. And then we also see a fair amount down in the Arkansas River Valley in the Sedgwick, Reno County area. Again, it's typically associated with fields that are already infested with soybean cyst nematodes. So uh, those two problems have to be treated separately. But uh, fortunately, uh, for fields with a, a history of sun death syndrome, uh, we've had a, a new fungicide product come on the market. It's been on for a couple of years now called Ilevo. It works very well, but it is not, you know, foolproof. You really need to combine the fungicide C treatment with good uh, SDS resistant genetics. You can add Ilevo to a susceptible variety and you're still, you'll, you'll get control, but you're still going to have more yield loss than what you would like. And so when you are looking at those fields with the known histories, uh, you really need to work with your seed company to get the the best genetics out there. And honestly, there there are no totally resistant varieties out there. Typically, companies rate them one as excellent, five as poor, and there are a lot of threes out there. Typically, fours and fives don't even make it to the market. And uh, there's there's some twos, but there really aren't any ones out there. So, you know, good genetics combined with good seed treatment will will help a lot. Well, the point being here, be sure to assemble your defenses against sudden death syndrome and the other potential soybean disease issues that could turn up in this growing season. For Doug, we're off to that kind of start in Kansas in this regard. And that means we'll have you back soon to catch up on what is developing further ahead in our corn, soybean and other row crops. Appreciate your time. Thank you. You're welcome. He's a row crop disease specialist with K-State Research and Extension, and with that briefing on what's being observed so far in fields around Kansas in this respect, Doug Jardine with us, and you're listening to Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128-plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, Authentic and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're listening to Agriculture Today from the campus of Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson here. 
For you now, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue said late yesterday that a second trade aid package for farmers may total 15 to $20 billion, the latter figure $5 billion higher than President Trump had suggested. In a call to reporters from South Korea, Perdue said that the 15 to $20 billion is the early estimate that the USDA has made regarding lost export sales to China since the tariffs were imposed on U.S. farm products in retaliation for the tariffs that the Trump administration imposed on Chinese products. Now, the secretary said that the USDA would calculate what he called the legally defensible trade damage done to our producers and give that estimate to the president and then would be prepared to defend those amounts to the World Trade Organization, where the U.S. could face charges of violating rules on subsidies. Purdue said he could not comment on whether the formula for providing payments to farmers would be different from the last package in which soybean growers got $1.65 per bushel, corn growers got a penny per bushel, and wheat growers got 14 cents. The USDA said at that time that the level for each commodity was based on export losses and calculated with an eye toward not violating WTO rules. Corn and wheat growers complained, however, and are lobbying the administration for a different formula in the second package. Now, noting on that the National Corn Growers Association has sent out an action alert to its members to call the White House and tell the president that the penny Quoting, didn't cut it then and won't cut it now. And a National Association of Wheat Growers spokesperson said that NOG had requested a meeting with USDA Chief Economist Rob Johansson and Agriculture Undersecretary for Trade and Foreign Agricultural Affairs Ted McKinney on the payment issue. Purdue said he believes that last package went well, but he realizes some farmers were not happy and said that the administration would try to learn from that experience and improve on it. He also said that although the president had talked about using a portion of tariff receipts to pay for the aid, he believes that the money will come from the Commodity Credit Corporation as it did last time. And he said he's keeping Congress informed about the development of the package, saying that the administration is studying the text of the supplemental disaster aid bill moving through Congress to see if there's an opportunity to address trade mitigation. But he wasn't clear about whether the administration would need funding from Congress to make the payments. The Commodity Credit Corporation can spend $30 billion per year. It's not known whether the CCC is bumping up against its spending cap this late in the fiscal year, which ends on September the 30th. Purdue said that in any case, he should keep Congress informed because those members are the purse keepers, as he said. The secretary also hinted that one reason the talks with China broke down last week was that China had reneged on previous agreements to buy certain levels of U.S. commodities. Purdue said that one of the purposes of the farm trade aid package is to make clear to Beijing that Chinese negotiators cannot use the impact of U.S. farmers in the negotiations. The problems China is having with African swine fever could have major effects far beyond China. Here's more from the USDA's Gary Crawford. The spread in China of the hog disease African swine fever. I think this is something all of us in agriculture need to keep a very close eye on. And U.S. Chief Ag Negotiator Greg Dowd says not just from the need to keep it out of the U.S., but also from what it could do to China's agricultural system and to world ag markets. He says there are normally about 600 million hogs in China, half the hogs in the world. China's already reporting just under 40 million hogs lost because of African swine fever, about a 9% loss. Some say that's a conservative number. Dowd says if the loss goes to 16%, that would be the equivalent of all the pork traded in the world. Or if they lost 30%, that would be rough roughly equivalent to all the hogs in the United States. Dowd says the situation in China may significantly alter China's demand for feed grains and oil seeds and also for meat. And have a major effect on production and market systems for those products. Not just in China, but for agriculture globally. In Washington, Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And the USDA's Farm Service Agency will now accept applications beginning June the 3rd, that is, for certain practices under the Continuous Conservation Reserve Program sign-up and will offer extensions for expiring CRP contracts. This will prioritize water quality practices, and a general sign-up will be coming up in December. A one-year extension will be offered to existing CRP participants who have expiring CRP contracts of 14 years or less. 
Next up, this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update with Greg Akagi. Greg? Emily Roush, a farmer with Our Family Farms in Lebanon, Kansas, joins us. And Emily, you have twice participated in the Farm Food Tour Dive into Science. So what is the Farm Food Tour all about? The Farm Food Tour is really just about connecting some dietitians and influencers throughout the country with farmers like myself and a couple other ones, creating that connection between them and the farmer, along with giving them the science and the why behind how we farm the way we do. Where do you guys stop on this tour? We actually stopped at Alanco Animal Health in the Kansas City area. And then the next day, we went to Bayer and we learned all of the goods behind how GMOs work and why we use them. And then on our way back to Kansas, we stopped at a small processing plant and kind of talked about how all of the meat at the grocery store is regulated by the USDA and how it's all safe. Why target bloggers and dietitians to be a part of this tour? They have such a large following. Folks go to the dietitians to learn what they should eat and how they should eat it. So they are giving their clients the why behind why all of your food is safe and not to be afraid of marketing tactics and labels. And then for the bloggers, we choose that because they can reach thousands of people across the Internet. And just going back to connecting all of those folks with farmers and the why behind we do, and they can really influence a lot of folks and what they choose to purchase. And overall, what is the goal that uh, you'd like to see on this tour? My goal is to see people more comfortable with their food and what they're buying, knowing that they don't have to spend the extra $5 to choose organic to make themselves feel good about their food. They now know where their food comes and that farmers like myself are taking care of that food from start to finish, and there shouldn't be any fear in what they're purchasing at the grocery store. That is Emily Roush, a farmer with Our Family Farms in Lebanon, Kansas, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Greg Akagi there. As always, thanks, Greg. And we'll be back with more on Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. We're back now on Agriculture Today and coming your way next to this week's horticulture segment and an unusual phenomenon going on out there in quite a few landscapes, we're told by our guest. He's been looking at those woody ornamental plants, which uh, have had quite a heavy bloom on them. And there are some offshoot effects of that we want to get into today as Ward Upham has joined us, horticulturist with K-State Research and Extension. This is a story that's been long in the making, you say, Ward. It certainly has. Now, this year I've seen more bloom on lilacs I've seen for years, but also I've seen more seed production on our elms and our maples than I've seen in years as well, especially it seems that the upper part of the tree. And so in order to understand what's going on, you have to look back at last year. Because that's when the buds were formed for the seed you're seeing this year. So it's not anything that happened over winter. This is something that happened last year, maybe even a little bit earlier. And I think what it is is probably the drought we had from about November of uh, 2017 through about April of 2018. And that put those trees under a tremendous amount of stress. Even though they're deciduous trees, they didn't have leaves for much of that time, they still used water. And those roots needed water. And so we probably saw some root damage during that period. So even though we had good rains last summer in many parts of Kansas, those trees are still under stress. And because of that, they set a lot of fruit buds. That's what 
trees do. If they're under stress, they're going to set a whole lot of fruit buds just in case they die. Then they have a lot of seed that is there, so they continue to survive through their progeny, through their young. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I think is going on. Now, that all in and of itself sounds like no issue, but in fact, that might be leading to slow leaf development on these trees yeah, and some of the shrubs, too. That's right. We're seeing a lot of that on the trees, especially the maples and the elms. Uh, we're seeing especially the top part of that tree just not leafing out very early. Now, usually they do leaf out, but it's a delayed leaf out, and there's a big difference between the bottom part of the tree and the upper part of the tree. And so if you think about water in the tree, the upper part of the tree is going to be further from that water source, and it's going to be under more stress, and often you see more seed production up there and a slower leaf out. And the reason for that is that plant uses up a whole lot of energy to set that seed, and there's not as much left in order to push out those leaves. And so, you know, we're just seeing trees where the bottom part looks great, top part just doesn't look that good. And so what we need to do is just give it a little more time. It will assume a more normal growth pattern. Yes, it will. It will. So just remember, those trees are under a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is make sure they don't undergo any more stress. Now, this spring, we've had an awful lot of rain. And that in some ways is good or it could be bad. You know, those roots need to breathe as much as they need water. And if you've had standing water around those trees, you put that root system under even more stress. So what we need to do this summer is water as needed. Don't overwater. Don't give them so much that that soil is saturated because that's going to harm that root system. But once it starts to get dry, we need to water and really watch those trees carefully. When we get a lot of rain like this, a lot of people think, well, they can go through half the summer without having any water, and that's not true. That root system's damaged. You're going to have to be very judicious in how you water this summer. So once we hit ward a stretch of several days of dry weather, it would behoove the homeowner to check soil moisture just to make sure. That's right. And one of the easy ways to do that is take a, a screwdriver with a long tang and try to push it in the soil. If it goes in easily, you've got plenty of water. When it starts to get really hard to push that in, you need to water that tree. And so when you water, water well. You want to take that water down to about 12 inches. Uh, that's, you're going to find 80% of a tree's roots in that top 12 inches of soil. Mm -hmm. So if you get that moist under the drip line of the tree, you'll be doing well. But you want to continue through the summer to check on some sort of uh, fairly frequent schedule to make sure that the water is available throughout the summer. Right? That's right. And we just remember those trees are under stress, and so we need to make sure that we baby them through this summer. How do you know you got down to 12 inches? Just take something like a piece of rebar, electric fence post, wooden dowel, anything you can push in the soil. You can push it in until you hit dry ground. And so make sure it goes in about a foot deep. What I do is just record the amount of time it took to do that. Yeah. And then once you've got that, you can just water on a set schedule as far as how long to water when you water. Now, as you know, folks often are tempted to, with plant material that would be under stress, with good intentions, add a little fertilizer. Is that not such a good idea most times? In most cases, it's not. What that tree actually needs is water. Now, once we get into the fall and we get where we're getting some leaf drop, then go ahead and fertilize. If you fertilize past about August 15th, you may be setting that tree up for winter damage. It can make it more succulent, more sensitive to cold if you do that that late in the season. Once those leaves start to drop as a natural phenomenon, then fertilizing is just taken up by the roots and stored till the next spring. Right. And as far as this prolific seed production, more than normal from these ornamentals this year, would that mean that we may see some sprouts here and there where they were not originally present? You're going to see a lot of that. I, I know at the K-State Gardens, they have a big American elm, and the ground is just coated with that seed. And so, yeah, you're probably going to be fighting those young trees coming up. It just depends on what tree it is. You know, American elms produce a lot of seed, germinates real easily. Red elm doesn't produce near as much, and it's not as easily to sprout it. But, you know, watch that as well. So it depends on where they germinate. If they're under shrubs, for instance, you may have to physically rogue those out at some point or the other. Yeah, you will. And it's a lot easier if you get a lot of rain because they pull out a lot easier then. 
Very good. But once more, think about the health of your woody ornamentals out there in your landscapes. Take a look for, you might assume, with the abundant to excessive moisture, those plants are doing well when, in fact, they may be recovering from the stress of last year and doing some interesting things physiologically. Plan to care intensely for those plants as we get into the summer heat, which we fully expect relatively soon. Ward, thank you for the word right here. You bet. That from K-State Research and Extension horticulturist Ward Upham, who, by the way, has authored an article on this very topic in the most recent K-State Horticulture newsletter on lots of flowers, lots of seeds, referring to those woody ornamentals out there. Find that at ksuhortnewsletter.org, ksuhortnewsletter.org. Give it a read. And that is this week's K-State Horticulture segment. Bringing our Thursday edition to a close. We'll return right here this same time tomorrow and hope you'll rejoin us then. Meantime, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.